Chapter Eighteen of Poison Romance and Poison Mysteries by Charles John Samuel Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen Tobacco Lore. Few, perchance, of the millions who gather comfort from the herb of fragrance are aware that it is to Don Hernandez de Toledo we are indebted for the introduction of tobacco into Western Europe, which he first brought to Spain and Portugal in 1559. Jean Nicot was at this time ambassador at the court of Lisbon from Francis the Second, and it was he who transmitted or carried either the seed or the plant to Catherine de Medici and who gave it the name nicotiana like other great personages of the time catherine encouraged the homage of travellers and artists it was considered to be one of the wonders of the new world and reported to possess most extraordinary medicinal properties and virtues thirty years later the cardinal santa croce returning from his nunciature in spain and portugal to italy took with him some tobacco leaves and we may form some idea of the enthusiasm with which its production was hailed from a perusal of the poetry which the subject inspired such as the following herb of immortal fame which hither first with santa croce came when he his time of nunciature expired back from the court of portugal retired even as his predecessor great and good brought home the cross the poet compares the exploit of the cardinal with that of his progenitor who brought home the wood of the true cross the first exact description of the plant is that given by Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo y Valdez, governor of Santa Domingo, in his Historia General de las Indies, printed at Sevilla in 1535. In this work the leaf is said to be smoked through a branched tube of the shape of the letter Y, which the natives called tobacco after the introduction of tobacco into england by sir walter raleigh on his return from america the custom of smoking the leaf became very general and it truly seems to have supplied a common want it was mostly sold by the apothecaries in their dark little shops and here the gallants would congregate to smoke their pipes and gossip while the real timidado nicotine cane and pudding was cut off with a silver knife on a maple block and retailed to the customers the pipes used in the time of queen elizabeth were chiefly made of silver the commoner kinds consisted of a walnut shell in which a straw was inserted and the tobacco was sold in the shops for its weight in silver the celebrated uh, counterblast to tobacco by king james i describes smoking as a custom loathsome to the eye hateful to the nose harmful to the brain dangerous to the lungs and in the black stinking fume thereof nearest resembling the horrible stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless in 1604 this monarch endeavoured by means of heavy imposts to abolish its use in this country and in 1619 he commanded that no planter in virginia should cultivate more than one hundred pounds it is said some spent as much as five hundred pounds a year in the purchase of tobacco in those days in 1624 pope urban the eighth published a decree of excommunication against all who took snuff in the church ten years after this smoking was forbidden in russia under pain of having the nose cut off and in sixteen fifty three the council of the canton of appenzell cited smokers before them whom they punished ordering all innkeepers to inform against such as were found smoking in their houses the police regulations made in Bern in 1661 were divided according to the Ten Commandments, in which the prohibition of smoking stands after the command against adultery. This prohibition was renewed in 1675, and the tribunal instituted to put it into execution, viz. Chambro Tabac, continued to the middle of the 18th century pope innocent the twelfth in sixteen ninety excommunicated all those who were found taking snuff or tobacco in the church of st peter at rome 
and even so late as seventeen nineteen the senate of strasbourg prohibited the cultivation of tobacco from an apprehension that it would diminish the growth of corn amurath the fourth published an edict which made smoking tobacco a capital offence but notwithstanding all opposition its fascinating power has held its own it is believed that the tobacco plant nicotiana tobacum is a native of tropical america and it was found by the spaniards when they landed in cuba in fourteen ninety two there seems little doubt that the practice of smoking the leaf has been common among the natives of south america from time immemorial it is now cultivated all over the world but nowhere more abundantly or with better results than in the united states Virginia is perhaps most celebrated for its culture. The young shoots, produced from seeds thickly sown in beds, are transplanted into the fields during the month of May and set in rows, with an interval of three or four feet between the plants. Through the whole period of its growth, the crop requires constant attention till the harvest time in the month of August the ripe plants having been cut off above their roots are dried under cover and then stripped of their leaves which are tied in bundles and packed in hogsheads while hung up in the drying houses they undergo a curing process consisting of exposure to a considerable degree of heat through which they become moist after which they are dried for packing in persia and turkey a form of tobacco is sold under the name of tumbeki for use in the water pipes or nahili which is said to be the product of the nicotiana persica the active principle of nicotine was first isolated in eighteen twenty eight by pusselt and ryman and is an almost colourless oily liquid of a highly poisonous nature it soon becomes brown on exposure to air or light the amount present in tobacco leaves varies considerably, but it is usually about 6%. It has not been met with in tobacco smoke, according to Vol, but the tobacco oils contain minute proportion of nicotine. One drop of pure nicotine is sufficient to kill a dog, while a very little more will destroy life in a human being. It is said to possess the property of resisting decomposition amid the decaying tissues of the body, and was detected by Orfila two or three months after death. Foll and Eulenberg have made an interesting investigation of tobacco smoke. The smoke analyzed was from a tobacco containing 4% of nicotine, but none of the alkaloid was found in the smoke in the smoke of cigars certain gases were given off and an oily body collected which on distillation yielded aromatic acids distilled at a temperature above boiling water tobacco gives an empyreumatic oil of a poisonous nature it exactly resembles that which collects in the stems of tobacco pipes and contains a small percentage of nicotine the actual amount of nicotine absorbed into the blood while smoking a pipe is very minute at least fifty per cent of the entire alkaloid being destroyed by decomposition and escaping from the bowl of the pipe the habitual inhalation of tobacco smoke is undoubtedly harmful but unless the smoke be intentionally inhaled very little makes its way into the lungs a great deal of misconception exists in the mind of the average individual as to the power of the alkaloid of tobacco. The amount of nicotine actually absorbed from a fair-sized pipe is about one-fortieth of a grain, in a cigar rather less. Death has resulted after smoking eighteen pipes, and from twenty cigars smoked continuously. Tobacco is a powerful sedative poison used in large quantities it causes vertigo stupor faintness and general depression of the nervous system it will sometimes cause excessive nausea and retching with feebleness of pulse coolness of the skin and occasionally convulsions but there seems very little known as to how these symptoms are produced employed to excess it enfeebles digestion produces emaciation and general debility and is often the beginning of serious nervous disorders 
be this as it may the moderate smoking of tobacco has in most cases even beneficial results and there appears little doubt that it acts as a solace and comfort to the poor as well as the rich it soothes the restless calms mental and corporeal inquietude and produces a condition of repose without a corresponding reaction or after effect in adults especially those liable to mental worry and all brain workers its action is often a boon the only danger being in overstepping the boundary of moderation to excess it is not suitable to every constitution and those who can trace to it evil effects should not continue its use end of chapter eighteen